Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today on the podcast is Professor of Practical Theology and Ethics, Melinda Magara Sharp, and she is a professor at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's right, the very same Phillips Theological Seminary that constantly and regularly supports and sponsors this podcast. So, you may not be surprised that today, Phillips Theological Seminary is a sponsor of the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. So, head on over to Phillips Theological Seminary's website, and there you can check out their theological degrees. You may want to get an MDiv. You may want to do it hybrid where you don't have to live there, but you travel there every once in a while and do stuff online. You may want to check out, and I'm just going to throw it out as a suggestion, their new masters in social justice. Well, head on over, check them out, and you can click through right from the website. Um, Today, Bo is going to be talking to uh, Melinda about her book, Misunderstanding Stories Toward a Postcolonial Pastoral Theology. And uh, when you hear it, you'll find out that Bo just pretty much gets so excited talking about practical theology with someone who he's been reading quite a bit of. Uh, uh, he's kind of like a little fanboy. I mean, you could say he he, he borders on becoming a faniac, but I, I feel like I, I can't tell him that's what he's become. He'll have to come to that experience and awareness uh, for himself. Anyway... I uh, hope you enjoy this podcast and do come over to homebrewedchristianity.com. You can link through to Amazon and get her book. You can leave us a message on the speak pipe. You can uh, leave a comment about the interview and uh, all, all sorts of things. Um, but uh, well, lastly, I just want to invite everyone to join Bo and I this summer for our summer school high gravity class. It's six weeks. We're going to be reading some books, talking about them, surveying a whole bunch of different options for contemporary Christian uh, theology. And uh, to to join, you just have to, you know, register for the class or be a homebrewed Christianity elder or bishop in the homebrewed Christianity community. Um, This week, we have two new elders that just joined, Julie O'Brien who is uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. And we have from West Palm Beach, Florida, Jason Fairbanks, brand new homebrewed Christianity elders and uh, joining the the community, getting an ecclesiastical title. Pretty sweet. And are going to be part this summer of our online class, our summer school class, Living Options in Christian Theology, uh, that Bo and I are doing. Um, So, Uh, Join the class, visit the website, but most importantly, what we really, really want you to do is to share the brew. Bo and I are very passionate and committed to bringing you the best ingredients so that you can brew your own faith. We don't want to think for you. We just want to think with you in your earbuds. You know what I'm saying? So uh, so share it and uh, and, and then give some feedback. Tell us who we should interview. Tell us your favorite books you've been reading and stuff because we want to. Keep interviewing people that interest you, impact you, get you thinking. So uh, now, here it comes. Bo getting way, 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 way into and excited about this interview. He's just gonna, he's just giddy with excitement. So prepare yourself. This here's Professor Sharp. Homebrewed Christianity. I am pleased to be on the other end of the line today from my new friend, Minnie McGarris Sharp. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah, I uh, stumbled on your work while I've been studying for my qualifying exams, and I reached out to you, and it turns out we have a lot in common. Great. For instance, yes. You you work at Phillips Theological Seminary. Yes. And they are a friend and sponsor of the show now, so that's a good connection. That's right. I saw that when I went to your webpage. Um, we are really happy about being a supporter, a fan. <laughs> and you're a United Methodist? Yes. Yep. And I am a proud convert to uh, working with the United Methodists, so there's <laughs> going to be lots of overlap here. It's going to be very collegial today. Great. And you love Bonnie Miller-Macklemore, and I studied <laughs> with her. 
Yes. Oh, I love. Yeah, and we and we just put out her podcast uh, last week. And you're one of her students, so this is going to be great. Yes. Wonderful. So talk to us. Yeah, talk to us about your background. How you kind of came into the academy through a unique uh, route. So talk to us about how you got here. Yes, I mean, historically, a lot of folks come into theology through medicine or both, but I um, am one of those who came into theology through pre-medicine, through thinking that I was um, headed toward a vocation in in the practice of medicine. Um, And it was really in um, college, in my university studies at the University of Virginia, where I shifted from a vocation of medicine as what I thought I was doing to a vocation of um, something else, (laughs) broadly academic theology, but it was still coming together. Um, And then only many years later did I come to uh, pastoral theology as as it, as the fit, so pastoral and practical theology. Um, So there were some very key turning points that in college and my studies that made that shift, and I'd be happy to talk about some of those if that would be helpful. Yeah, and um, you ended up going to Yale, and then you you took some time off, and then you finished at Vanderbilt. But talk to us about what happened in that window between Yale and Vanderbilt. Yes, yes. So this started happening, like I mentioned before Yale, when I was still at UVA, um, and I was having these experiences of um, what someone like William James would call the more. So um, I my degree changed from pre-medicine to religion when I took a class on post-Holocaust theological ethics uh, with Peter Oakes, great scholar. Um, and realized that I needed to devote my life to constructive theology that will not justify that kind of violence. So I had that moment. Um, And then volunteering in the hospital, I had many, many moments of more, shall we say. Like uh, one example I point to is um, I just was drawn to the women in this case Uh, the unit where I was working, whose job was to deliver food and flowers and meals to rooms where stillbirths had occurred, which it's like sort of a medical situation, but it's really a theological situation um, and an existential situation. So I had, I was drawn to the more, and I, I went to Yale Divinity School instead of applying to medical school to really think more about that. And at Yale, I did one of those really fast MTS degrees, two years, studied with some of the amazing women um, theologians who were there at the time, Margaret Farley, Letty Russell, Serene Jones, and Kristen Leslie were huge, um, huge influences for me. Um, And so I, I was clear that I wanted a vocation of theology, I was clear that my theology needed to account for violence in the world, and uh, particularly around the history of Christianity and around embodied diversity um, in all the intersectional ways that I can now name. I didn't quite have the language for it at the time, but um, there was something that I felt I needed to learn by not going straight into a PhD program, Um, and so I joined the Peace Corps left the academy, joined the Peace Corps, um, applying for, applied for the Peace Corps, I should say, first. That was an 18-month um, process of discernment in and of itself. Um, and then came back to uh, my doctoral work after that. So um, for me, I, I had to leave the academy and uh, figure out what kind of life experiences and on a global scale, I wanted my work to be accountable to, um, and I sure got that kind of set of experiences in the Peace Corps. Yeah. So your uh, book is telling some stories about your experience in the Peace Corps, and uh, or it's built around those stories. And so your book is called Misunderstanding Stories. 
Yes, Misunderstanding Stories. Um, and the subtitle, which I'm really passionate about too, <laughs> as many academics are toward a post-colonial pastoral theology, um, which is the claim of movement in the field, but not of arrival at post-colonial pastoral theology. Um, so yes, Misunderstanding Stories toward a post-colonial pastoral theology is um, my first book, and it really uh, started to come together in my doctoral work and my dissertation um, where I applied for doctoral work from the small village in um, the middle of the Amazon rainforest where I was serving, and I really brought as much as I could that experience to all of the books I was reading and the theories I was learning, the methods I was studying um, as a, a point of accountability. And I try to let um, whatever particular interest um, would drive my, my first huge academic focus to be driven by what questions kept coming up for me, um, what stories kept coming up for me. And I just kept thinking of not only the amazing depth of intercultural relationships that is possible, but also what happens when in intercultural relationships, there is huge misunderstanding, very passionately felt, and people can stay in relationship and um, have regard, mutual regard for each other in practice across language differences, across privileges of all kinds. Um, and that really, those are the stories that drives this book. So misunderstanding stories, um, really in this book, using my... Uh, Peace Corps as a as a case study, and again, I wasn't in the Peace Corps as a student. I was there as a um, volunteer and really studied that experience after the fact um, in a different way that contributed to this book. Yeah, one of the things I really resonated with in some of the stuff uh, I was reading from you is, you know, we don't have the luxury of not being cross-cultural or intercultural in the world that we live in. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to go to, I mean, a different country, although in a globalized world, we certainly do cross borders all the time. But just Some living, in, can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, living in any city in North America, you live in an intercultural context. And so Absolutely. it's just not an option unless you intentionally go somewhere that is more homogenous or unicultural. Um, we just don't have that luxury anymore. So our stories are going to inter overlap and there's going to be misunderstanding. Absolutely. This is something that I try to be clear about in the book that for me, um, for a number of reasons, I, felt called, um, and it was a sense of call, to a global service situation, which was full of privilege. So, right, I could choose to do that. I could make a choice whether I wanted to give a preference of what country I wanted to go to. Um, I could leave at any point. I mean, this was full of privilege, and I acknowledge that first thing in the book. Um, but that kind of... Um, two-year commitment to go somewhere else is not um, required for the questions of misunderstanding across cultural contexts that are alive and well, not just in towns and cities, but in families and at Thanksgiving and um, Thanksgiving itself being a great case study in the United States context of intercultural um, violent and hopeful narratives all coming together. Yeah. Um, so I can't decide whether to ask you the political question first. I'll hold that off. Let's talk about some of your, uh, let's go with some of the, your case study. Uh, mm -hmm. Give us an example. Give us an example of uh, the, the kind of story that intrigued you enough that you wanted to frame your investigation. Uh, in that, give us a taste for a, a story that that caught your imagination there. 
Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you the short version. And of course, every question and every story, and particularly the mm-hmm. stories, are political. So um, it's already political the way that I'm choosing the story and telling it. Um, but a story that continues to haunt me happened um, midway through my Peace Corps service, where um, it's a kind of train the trainers model. Um, so volunteers who had been in the country for some time um, helped train new volunteers. And so my one of my jobs was to talk to a group of new volunteers about um, the particular area where we were had very specific gender roles and very specific cultural practices around menstruation. Um, and so my task was to talk to a new group of volunteers about this um, and share what I had learned and try to be kind of a cultural broker role in that. And so I got permission from the village to do this kind of uh, embodied education and was walking around the village um, pointing out areas not to go while menstruating, whatever these new volunteers wanted to think about um, the cultural practices as they learned them, whether to practice um, or learn how to practice or not. Um, there were these places not to go, whatever you believed about the practice, just don't go there during menstruation. Um, but for me, this was like such a um, helpful thing to do, a wholehearted kind of activity, but it turns out what is so obvious in retrospect, I was outing the most sacred signs of the village to a group of strangers, um, and I actually had one of the uh, women leaders of the village stop me and say, you are being the colonizer again, and she used the male term, which was interesting, um, and stop and go away and stop doing this, and so... For me, it was this really intense moment of um, intercultural misunderstanding where I was violating something that I would not want to violate, and I was also doing something I thought would be respectful at the same time. Um, Wow. So this stay in relationship much later, I mean, you know, not right there in the heat of the moment, Um, although we didn't have a great relationship at that moment, but it was intense, and I was able to work with the women in the village um, and the leadership of the village through processing that story over time. So I do mention that in the book. I go into depth more about some of the other stories, but yes, that's the kind of thing um, that I'm working on in this book. Wow. So you were trying to be honoring and to help build a bridge cross-culturally. And while doing that with one hand, and the other hand, you did something uh, somewhere between offensive and, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you violated at some level the very thing that you were trying to preserve or honor. How do you even Absolutely. avoid? Do, how do you even avoid doing something like that? So this is the the point of the book. We can't avoid doing something like that, and it doesn't just happen when you're visiting another city or another town or another country. All the time, we are violating the things that we hold most dear at the same time. Um, so my thesis in the book is that misunderstanding stories are alive and well all the time for all of us in different ways as human beings. Um, and if we can can bring those to voice and stay in relationship while listening and bearing to hear each other, um, that that brings us to a, a place of deeper recognition and healing um, on an intercultural level, but also just on a human level. So my the practice I would recommend, which I'm kind of working on now, is not to try to um, preemptively avoid misunderstanding stories. Um, that are deep and difficult and passionate, um, but to to be present to those and stay in relationship and learn right there in those moments. Mm. Is there any chance that the simpler solution is just uh, for us 
not to go uh, to those places? Like, why are we even there in the first place? Is that the question behind the question? Um, not necessarily. I wouldn't put it that way, although that's a really good question. Um, so clearly my work has implications for missions and missiology, although that's not uh, my primary field is practical theology and pastoral theology. Um, so there is the question, right? Do, you know, why go? The mission is alive and well in all kinds of Christian churches. Um, and as practices of faith, uh, it's a huge, a lot of money wrapped up in it, a lot of time wrapped up in it. Um, and so, you know, recently, um, I'm now taking students to, uh, on several kinds of immersion trips. So I'm, this is a live question for me. Um, and one of those was I took some, uh, women, demon students to Nicaragua to learn from, um, women, collaborative leaders who are probably the world's expert in teaching demon students about collaborative leadership for women. Um, and while we were there, we asked the community, the leadership community, you know, we could have taken money from all these plane tickets and our, you know, lost time and work and things people had had to, you know, hire consultants to do while they were gone. Um, and just funneled that money into something and not come here. And do you, we just asked the community, like, what do you think? Should we be here? Or is this, is this a good use of, of our time and relationship? Um, and so I was really interested at the community's response. And again, it's just one community and one day in that community's life. So uh, it's not, um, worth extrapolating into something that holds in all places and all times and all contexts. But this, at this conversation, the community said, you would definitely not understand us or what we need by not coming. Um, so because we came not to fix something or do something, but to um, listen really and learn about leadership, uh, the community wanted to teach us that. And it just so turns out that um, the way that global privilege and citizenship privilege works is it's very difficult for the amazing people that we met in Nicaragua to come to the United States um, and teach us here. So there, I wrestle a lot in my own practice of teaching between, you know, going there and staying here and these concepts of here and there start to break down, like you say, around borders. But, um, you know, when we look at at the borders in the United States, they're, they're easy to cross for people with certain kinds of um, papers mm. and real hard for other people. And that is, that is political and um, it can prevent the very kind of learning that we need to think more deeply about misunderstanding stories. So I really like your international story. Uh, I, my father is, uh, has a ministry called Global Leadership, and I've, ha- I've been privileged to travel with him to lots of countries around the world, and I've made all kinds of mistakes cross-culturally, and so I really resonate with that. But I want to bring it closer to your home, into the middle of the United States. Mm-hmm. So you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's Phyllis. And when I think of Oklahoma, three things come to mind. The Cherokee Trail of Tears, Mm -hmm. the forced march. uh, The second thing is the story that you were telling me where there used to be a black Wall Street in Tulsa. And a hundred years ago, you guys are coming up on the anniversary of it. uh, It burned down and, and the kind of racist legacy Uh, that that has set off for economic disparity. And then the third thing is, yeah, the third thing is the boomer sooner, the covered wagon, homestead settler. So when I think of Oklahoma, I have all these cultural and racial historic uh, pictures come to mind. What does it look like for you to do your work there where you are? Well, this is an excellent question. So um, I've lived here for five years teaching at Phillips, um, and I have brought these factors that you mentioned, the, the Trail of Tears, 
Black Wall Street in Tulsa and the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, um, and more recently, this idea of the boomer sooner, particularly around um, the events of racism um, coming out from the University of Oklahoma and the, the president claiming that real sooners, you know, are, are not racist, so then needing to go unpack that a little bit. So, of course, I have focused my work of practical theology right here in the context where I live and move and have my being, um, and that's a claim of practical theology that contextual fluency is not only important, but extremely important, um, and I use the word cross-contextual fluency just to to piggyback on something we talked about earlier about crossing borders all the time. Um, so just one example of this it, that I'm working on um, right now, <laughs> this month, and uh, I'll be presenting next month, or next week, actually, um, on this, is uh, a standard in the Oklahoma State curriculum um, at the elementary school level of learning Oklahoma history by reenacting the land run. Um, so I just witnessed my first land run reenactment at a local elementary school where, just like you said, students dressed up in um, period dress and turned radio flyer wagons and covered wagons and made their lunches and the, the principal blew the whistle and they claimed their land and there was lots of uh, land office um, handing out mock seeds. Well, I, I mean, that's, you could say, uh, one way of learning history. It's an embodied kind of fun exercise, but um, the embodied part makes it not fun to me, although I witness kids having fun because, um, as has just recently been recognized in Oklahoma City, I live in Tulsa, it's a different system, but um, this is kind of a celebration of genocide built into the history curriculum, and Oklahoma City um, actually just removed this this year, 2015, from the elementary school curriculum. So I am studying practical theology right here where I am around this particular case study, um, and trying to make sense of, in a field of practical and pastoral theology that uses case studies, uses role play to learn, um, how can these very tools of role play and case study um, come to instill violence as normative? And um, I don't know. It's very troubling. Do you think that there is um, a connection between in reenactments like that and the way that they uh, groom or socialize us, form us in some way, and incidents like the frat boys on the bus at the University of Oklahoma uh, with the racist chant that was recorded and went viral, do you think there's a connection between being uh, socialized or the way that we are uh, groomed or conditioned with the reenactments and those kind of things. Can you draw a direct parallel there or is it much too complicated to try and connect the dots there? Well, I think the one way that oppression works is to pit um, people who are made to be oppressed against each other. So, to say, well, this oppression was worse than that oppression, and there's, there are no connections. And that alliances among persons who are made to be oppressed are really um, gaining. <laughs> um, sorry, I need to start over that one. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, but I'll just say alliances um, between formerly oppressed or continually oppressed groups um, is, is a path of healing and justice. So, um, I see clear connections, and I have a, a friend um, who shared with me recently, and I've seen this in curriculum as well, you know, visiting a school class trip to a plantation and not talking about slavery in the United States, or, um, you know, early in elementary school curriculum, even, you know, Thanksgiving Day celebrations or... Um, holiday celebrations, or just kind of instilling this is the normative narrative, the dominant narrative, 
um, the publishing industry around uh, textbook for elementary um, education is um, extremely political, and you know there's there are dominant narratives, and so I think um, I have young kids right now, and so I'm seeing this in a new way through being a, a parent. But um, I think there are clear connections between um, learning dominant narratives, needing to reenact dominant narratives as as reenactment and, and role play are really important forms of study. I believe that in my own teaching. Um, but without this kind of critical edge of, of complicity and violence. Um, and so when I talk to teachers and principals and activists here locally about that, you know, some folks will say, well, you know, second grade, third grade, first grade is too young to talk about um, post-colonialism, what I would call post-colonialism or um, complicity in violence or structural dehumanization. Um, and on one sense, you know, there there is a, um, a developmental schema of being able to think more complexly. Um, and, you know, when I read a book like um, Tim Tingle's work. Uh, He's a great talk talk storyteller. When I read some of his work for children with my own children, um, some of it is okay and others of it causes nightmares. Um, And so, you know, I don't expect my children to be reading Franz Fanon with me, although I (laughs) bring that to the dinner table, actually, in my home (laughs) in other ways. Um, And so... Yeah, I think there's connections. I don't think kids are too young to learn how to hate and dehumanize, so I don't think they're too young to learn um, radical acts of love and um, listening either. But I, I do work with um, educational theorists to try to, to get more access into the best ways to doing that. And storytellers like uh, Tim Tingle or like... Um, some great storytellers that we have here in Tulsa uh, that work through the Don Hope Franklin Center to try to help kids understand the race massacre of 1921 um, before they get to high school or college or, or even in my own classes at the seminary level. I have students of all ages who grew up in Oklahoma who don't know much about the 1921 uh, race massacre. And I use the word massacre. It's usually called the race riot. Um, and this word riot is live and well right now, of course, in um, contemporary politics and media. And and um, there are implications around using the word riot that um, families and businesses have about making insurance claims. So the, I try to listen to my colleagues at places like the Don Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation here in Tulsa who encourage using the word massacre to um, to remember that by calling this event a riot, a lot of the wealth of Black Wall Street was unable to be recovered um, because insurance claims couldn't be processed mm-hmm. in the same way. So very political, very heated, um, and um, a lot of opportunity to talk about misunderstanding stories right here in the homeland. Mm-hmm. Let me shift gears, and because I feel safe with you, I'm just going to ask a whole bunch of. I'm going to I'm going to play a character called the um, the concerned white guy, and uh, this is a person who's not overtly uh, resistant, but just concerned about some of the stuff you've said. Is that okay if I play that character? Sure, I've um, met several of those characters recently, <laughs> and I am that character sometimes. Yes. Oh. Oh, you met that guy too? Yeah, he's a nice guy. He's just, uh, he's a little concerned. I'm glad you've met him now. Yes. Okay. So you've, you've brought up Thanksgiving twice. You're probably one of those, uh, people who doesn't celebrate Columbus Day. What's your problem with Thanksgiving? Right. So the thing I love about Thanksgiving is highlighting practices of gratitude um, and instilling that early. The problem I have with Thanksgiving is the, um, I think of, in my mind, from my own childhood, even from being a parent now, of the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. 
right? So um, here's this this story. It's cartoon. It's kind of harmless. It's really fun. Um, you, the music may enter your mind if you're someone who likes the, the Charlie Brown um, shows. And so in the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, there's this table, there's food, and there's this um, differently clothed indigenous person who um, is in need of help and is just depicted in the cartoon itself as less than human or less than the kind of human that uh, Snoopy gets elevated to. So um, my problem with Thanksgiving is the narrative of dehumanization, which can be present and I think um, is present in the dominant narratives um, that at the same time I love, right? At the same time, I love the gratitude and gratitude cross-culturally that is celebrated and it feels a little bit more possible. Although, I don't know, Thanksgiving dinners can be a little heated in families. So, but if gratitude feels more possible and more beautiful um, on Thanksgiving. But I think without this critical edge of the dominant narrative of domination, really, um, that it's it's problematic. Like most practices, both beautiful and problematic at the same time. And that's okay, unless we only live in the beautiful piece and, and never bring up the problematic piece. Mm. Question two from my concerned character. Mm-hmm. So you use words like oppression and domination, uh, colonialism, but really aren't those kind of niche words within the academy? I mean, there's a certain segment of the population that's concerned with like race, gender, class, but it's really kind of a niche market. Don't you think using those kind of words just gets people's tackles up and uh, puts them on the defensive? Mm, yes, this can happen very easily, right? It can become a an insular conversation about um, words and emotions that are tied to the politics around those words. That's really um, exacerbating practices of exclusion and, um, well, working against the cause of justice. So, but I think that these words are important because it's important to call something what it is. And for me, um, you know, as someone who's trying to bring post-colonial theory into conversation with pastoral and practical theology, um, that word post-colonial carries with it a sense of the temporal. So post means after, so we're living after, so what's the problem? (laughs) It's done. Um, Whereas when I look at at people who study, you know, generational traumatic memory, like someone like Amy Lone Tree, um, whose work I've been really reading a lot more of lately and really um, find amazing, or Tracy Sharply Whiting, um, without using these kind of um, sharply phrased words, um, it, it can seem like either oppression and domination and colonialism are happen, you know, happen in the past and we're kind of working through the aftermath, but it's over, or they only happen over there or over there or over there, but not here. And so my role is to choose to engage rather than to um, what I'm working on to engage my own complicity all the time in these kinds of um, practices of dehumanization is, is how I use it. And it's certainly wrapped up in language. Hmm. Speaking of language, third and last question from my concerned character. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, language is important, which is why when when people talk about privilege or microaggression or stuff mm-hmm. like this, it doesn't help the conversation because they're like buzzwords by which people who have felt like, you know, they... Uh, we're getting the short end of the stick, now have the upper hand, and they play it down like a trump card, and you can't say anything in response. When somebody accuses you of saying something that's, you know, offensive or checks your privilege or it's a microaggression, and now they have this new trump card, it's just it's just the same side of the coin. It's the same, you know, problem, only now, you know, it's like being used against you. 
and like you're a good guy and you're trying and then somebody says something like that and you're paralyzed because you can't get defensive or they go, oh, see, you, you know, you got all defensive. Check your privilege. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, so part of the thing that we do when there's a misunderstanding story is just uh, leave, right? We check out um, or get defensive or take over the conversation. Um, so I think part of what you're getting at is this idea that there are two sides of the story. Um, and there's actually even this great curriculum I was reading in, in education, um, fields of education called Taking Sides, and it's just a bunch of case studies. Like, here's one side, here's the other. It's like a debate structure, right? Here's one side, here's the other. Um, let's talk about it. Well, um, as we see in in the parts of pastoral and practical theology where I'm heavily invested, there's been a huge move to multiplicity, which is not a new thing, but um, is a new emphasis, certainly, within theology. Um, and so reducing any kind of situation to two sides, where there's the person with privilege and the person without privilege, or there's, um, there's this way of looking at it and there's the opposite way of looking at it is always going to minimize the conversation and dehumanize someone, <laughs> usually the other side who's not me. Um, and so what can happen easily is what you're talking about, where um, this kind of white paralysis or white guilt just takes over and ends up taking away all the air in the room and contributes to mistrust instead of the kind of trust building uh, across many stories and many experiences um, in the smallest community that needs to be happening um, right here in my community and your community all over the place. Um, so, so sure, you know, bringing up privilege um, can shut down a conversation. I see that happen again and again. Um, and part of shutting down that conversation can be, you know, silence or paralysis, like you mentioned, or it can be, um, more often, I see it as a, a bunch of of really wholehearted, well-meaning white allies stop being allies. And I, I really like uh, Mia McKenzie's definition of ally. I've been using and uh, trying to use more often in practice, but also in my writing and speaking, which is an ally is someone who's actively engaged in partnership with someone else and not just kind of a theoretical position. Um, but that active engagement takes trust building, and that trust building means entering into the politics of language together and staying in a relationship, um, even when it's really difficult and I feel defensive and there's resistance and um, it feels like we're not getting anywhere. Those stuck moments, I use um, Kurt Wolf's theory of surrender and catch, those being caught up in those moments is, is a huge opportunity for going deeper in relationship. Or it can just dissolve things back into the status quo. Um, so it's a hinge moment. Well, thank you for being uh, patient with my concerned character. I'm, I'm going to put that away and move into using my real voice. Uh, I am curious about so much of your work. I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff at you, and I, just, I was hoping to get your uh, just – kind of some feedback from you on some of the things and places I have found your work. Great. So the first time I heard of you, I was reading a, my new favorite book. I read it about a year ago. It's called Opening Up the Field of Practical Theology. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's such a fantastic overview of so many different spectrums uh, of, the, of the field. But you got major prop in this book for being somebody who took your own uh, context and social location seriously, why did they give you such big props? And did you know that was coming ahead of time? Um, I had a little bit of notice um, from one place, but yeah, it was it was kind of a nice uh, surprise to be uh, recognized in that way. Um, and I don't think there's anything you know, so great about me compared to my colleagues, but that the point is that being clear about one's context um, and complicity is is part of the work of pastoral and practical theology and recommending recommending transformative practices. Um, so, 
Can you um, state the question again? I think I got a little away from it. Yeah. Wh- why did you get such big props from them? What, 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 what is it about your work that they thought it was worth lifting up or highlighting uh, for emerging scholars like myself who might be reading this book to look at how you address your so- social location and take it seriously? Why do you think that, that you caught their attention like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, thank you for restating the question. Um, I think what I try to do in my book is um, what I have learned from particularly um, feminist pastoral theologians and practical theologians who've come before me about naming social location um, as important. And if you take just, for example, the, the series that um, Jeannie Stevenson Mesner edited along with several amazing partners, um, that series in pastoral theology was a set of edited books um, by women authors that uh, gave lots of women opportunities to write into the field. Um, but started in the beginning, and this isn't just my original idea, this is um, well documented by the editors themselves, of saying, you know, we know this is our social location as women theologians who um, are just starting to get um, a voice, at least in academic theology publications, not really in having a voice, but being recognized as having a voice. Um, And we invite other people to speak up and come into this space from other contexts. Well, eventually... um, the, the editors of this volume, which I contributed to the last one, Women Out of Order, uh, with Bonnie Miller McLemore and a co-authored piece, um, said, well, wait a minute, like those avenues of invitation are great, except there's, there's really not a way that a group of scholars, um, representing a wide variety of contexts can, um, just put a book proposal together and publish it. And, and this is, you can see this in, um, in any kind of syllabus that takes a, a temporal approach where, you know, the history of this or the history of that, um, if you study only by publication date, women and persons of color and people from all over the world um, appear in, you know, week 13 of week 13 because that's when publishing avenues became open. So these volumes started saying, oh, well, part of our location is that um, we have access to publishing. You know, this is feminist the feminist movement to um, recognizing that feminism isn't just about white middle-class women who were fortunate enough to to get a position in academia, which is still very hard to do. Um, But but this is a a set of experiences, and um, all of us people as human beings need to work together to to open up more avenues of um, contribution and publication, particularly within, within academics. So I, what I try to do in the book is say, you know, I'm part of a system that is exclusive. Um, it played out in this way in my Peace Corps service. It plays out in this way when I look at developmental psychology. Um, it plays out in this other way when I look at self-psychology. So it's kind of like theor- theoretical contributions of the book. Um, but it also is certainly alive and well in academia. So where I, where I see my work being lifted up and opening the field is um, trying to name my context not just as descriptive, but also including um, a little bit of the politics of my of my mm. context as well. It's a hard thing Two, to do. I'm still working on it, but I'm trying. <laughs> Two final questions. Yes. Uh, in this in this section here. So you got to write a chapter in the Wiley Blackwell Companion to Practical Theology. Bonnie Miller Macklemore uh, watched over that project, brought in 56 different authors, and you were one of them. So two quick questions about that. Number one, did you get a free copy of the book after it came out <laughs> as one of the contributors? Uh, yes, this book um, does have quite a price tag. So. Um, <laughs> Back to the comment about complicity in a structure of privilege. <laughs> um, right. Who can afford? It's gone down. It's in paperback now, which is wonderful. A lot of um, publishers just have to um, 
go in hardback first, which makes it inaccessible for a lot of people. Um, I did get one copy of the book. Yeah. And I cherish that copy. I have a hard time writing in it. Um, yeah, I, I bought it on yeah. Kindle. Yes, that's right. It's available electronically as well. Yeah. Okay, that um, was just a, yes. kind of a funny question. Oh, uh, The second thing is, why did you get to write on – you wrote in post-colonial and globalization – that is a, um, an amazingly relevant topic, and you got to write the chapters. Talk to us about uh, like what uh, brought you to have that as one of your concerns. Well, um, thank you. It's a great question. Um, yeah, I feel hugely honored to be both in the Women Out of Order book that I mentioned earlier, but also in the Blackwell Companion, the Practical Theology, um, and... I mean, my my work really is trying to bring together post-colonial theory and pastoral and practical theology explicitly. Um, I'm not the only one working on this, for sure, but I am working on this, and there aren't, shall we say, a whole lot of people working on it in the field, certainly historically. So I think um, that my work has already started, you know, in my early time in the academy to be published, and this is... Uh, what I'm saying that I'm concerned about and what I am concerned about. So so there was a fit there, um, and then I'm sure there are a lot of kind of, there are always politics around who gets to contribute to something and who's left out. Um, so there are, you know, 50 more people who maybe should have or could have been included also in the volume, although um, it is quite weighty, as you as you mentioned, already has so many voices represented um and because practical theology is a is a field of multiplicity, so those voices are really important, and um, mm-hmm. I really appreciate being able to to reflect there. Um, so yes, I saw that as a huge opportunity and and a, an amazing chance to to articulate my work um, using these big words: globalization and colonialism and post colonialism um, to talk about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. That was a great answer, by the way. Last question in this segment uh, before we get to the the Practical Theology Project. Mm-hmm. So you co-authored uh, a piece with Bonnie Miller McLemore asking mm-hmm. the question, are there limits to the intercultural, specifically in the pastoral context, are there limits? And so that's the question I wanted to close with with you. Is I'm, I'm curious. Uh, in the context of misunderstanding stories, intercultural uh, exchanges, um, is are there limits pastorally that we need to be concerned about? Right. So Bonnie Miller Methmore and I um, co-authored a piece in Women Out of Order called "Are There Limits." Um, so that's how it starts. At least I'm sure we have a much longer title in the actual piece. Um, and what we were thinking about there in particular is, you know, where are the boundaries for pastoral theologians to make recommendations for transformative practice, which is this last turn in a practical theology methodology. Um, to, to It's the first turn and the last turn, right? To start with a practice, um, to engage a deep study of that practice, and then to end with some kind of recommendations for practice. So. What we are wrestling with is um, what do pastors and pastoral theologians and um, nonprofit leaders and ministry um, servants, shall we say, um, what do we appeal to, um, certainly in a, a U.S. American context, to make these recommendations of practice? Well, we appeal a lot of times to U.S. law. We appeal to scripture. We appeal to um, sometimes the UN declarations, although um, when you look carefully, the United States hasn't signed on to the very declarations that we wanted to use in that chapter around the rights of children. Um, And so we call for um, a huge limit for uh, pastors and leaders not to assume that I have as an individual in this particular context, all the information that I need to make transformative recommendations for practice um, 
that will hold. So what do I need to do? What's missing? I actually need to ask other people <laughs> um, what they think about these recommendations, um, hopefully before I publish them, um, and bear to hear and respond and, and be present to the, the answer. And this in my pastoral care classes is um, I've extended to kind of my definition of my working definition of pastoral care is um, practices of care that employ radical listening where I'm not only um, listening and, and speaking in the ways that are deeply rooted in the, in the discipline and very careful and concerned and justice oriented um, ways, but I'm also always asking the question, is this, am I hearing this? Is this recommendation um, actually contributing to further harm, um, my complicity in further harm, and daring to hear the response there? So it's it's a call for a limit of individualism, um, but also of normative claims that are, that are not tested in partnerships. Um, and in some ways, this kind of claim of limit is built into the structure of practical theology of always being accountable to experience and um, considering experience to be a worthy source for theological reflection, um, but also um, extending that as academics. So, so just our model of co-authoring is one way to, um, on a small scale, try to model that, um, to co-author rather than to singly author. Um, although you got a single author books to, to make it in the academy, it seems like. So there's, there's a tension there, right? A political tension there. Um, mm. Does that get at what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. You... This has been wonderful, and I want to thank you uh, for taking time to talk with me. I've been really uh, enjoying uh, your work and uh, interacting with you in four different uh, places uh, that you've been published. So getting you on the phone has just been really fantastic, and I just want to thank you for being so gracious with your time. I know that you've got a busy day. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to think through my work on a um, a little bit of a macro level. Hopefully there's more to come. <laughs>